This is Deborah Atkinson, and you're listening to Flipping 50, where I address your top struggles and concerns, and I share with you how to eat, how to move, and how to change your mindset so that you can get the energy and the vitality that you want, need, and deserve in this second and better half. And today, it's me under fire. So it's all me, no interview, and I'm answering questions, but not reader questions today. Well, indirectly reader questions, but a compilation of them all about me. These are the like backstage, backstage questions that I get asked. So very often that I don't often address in public with all of you, but it's the dirt about like what I eat in a day. What do I order if I go to a restaurant? Little tidbits and tips that may get us a little bit more intimate in our relationship. You'll know me a little bit better by listening to this. And I think some of these are truly things I would be curious about with other people as well. So I hope you enjoy it. Many of these have come directly from you and I may have tweaked a question or two as an offshoot of a question. And the very last one is, of course, the one I ask all of our guests, is there a question I should have asked you? And I'll put that in there too. First, before we get started in this game of 20 questions today, I need to let you know that I am so excited. The Flipping 50 membership, the virtual gymbership university, my whole world, and hopefully yours is open or will be very soon while I'm recording this and releasing this in the middle of June in 2020. We open twice a year. That's at half year. It's like the Nordstrom shoe store and the beginning of the year. So perfect times to actually take a group of women getting started, getting them initiated into the flipping 50 world and off to the right start. And here's the mantra that I use to do that, that a recent study showed you can reverse the effects of 179 genes associated with aging by lifting weights twice a week for six months. So many of our programs, as you know, are 12 week long strength training programs, stronger one, two, three, four, and as of July, stronger five. And those programs are all included inside. Each one of them is a value of $197 at regular rate. So imagine you're getting not just at least $1,000 worth of exercise options for strength training, but there are also interval training and Pilates and yoga. Ways you can exercise to solve problems you have, whether it's weight loss, cellulite, energy, your joints hurt even though you want to work hard, we've got you covered. If you're wondering how to boost your metabolism with changing hormones, wonder what are the messages that I'm getting right now and coming from my hormones and how do I adjust my lifestyle habits and my exercise? It's all inside. We've got you covered. You are the VIPs, those of you who are in our membership site. During COVID-19, for instance, not even a part of the membership when it was just a glimmer in my eye four and a half years ago. But I've been doing live workouts, intervals, getting in with slower, lower intensity workouts as well, just to connect. And our members from wherever they are in the world will tell me that those live workouts have helped keep them connected and motivated during this time when it's so easy to get distracted by other things. And whether you join us live or not, it's nice to know that somebody in your team in camp was live today, and so probably you should be too. So I'm going to put the link in the show notes, but you've got to be quick. You either want to get on the list if the doors aren't quite open yet, so you get the first notification and you don't miss it, because once the doors are closed, they're closed, and we've got to stick to our word. Secondly, I want to let you know if you're listening and you're a fitness professional or a health coach, I've got you covered too. 
The Flipping 50 Fitness Specialist is hot and not bothered right now. In June and July, we're definitely promoting launching because come fall, things will settle in. We may be in this moment we're in more people at home, more people choosing to exercise at home, but they all want help, especially women in midlife. And if you are a trainer or a coach and you're here and or you want to be, there's nobody better than a midlife woman to help another midlife woman. Would we all agree on that? Can I have an amen? <laughs> I will put the link to the Flipping 50 Fitness Specialist below the show notes. And if you happen to be working somewhere with a trainer and you wonder, is he or she certified in hormone balancing exercise so that I know with confidence the person I'm working with is actually giving me an exercise prescription dedicated not just to what's happening with my joints and physical movement, but literally helping my energy system, my endocrine system, put me back in balance and make me feel better, not just tired. All right, let me dive in. I can't stall anymore. So I'm going to start with this one. And actually, two of these questions come from my son's girlfriend. So number one, I hear this from a lot of people, others included, not just her, but what do you eat in a day? So let me just give you a typical example, and it's probably easiest to tell you what I had yesterday. So first of all, um, I'm working a little bit more on my intermittent fasting window, so pushing breakfast a little bit later. However, I get up and I will have a cup of matcha tea, so green tea leaves powdered, so it's a really concentrated form of green tea. I will have a couple mugs of that, let's be totally honest, and that already will help you, um, that breaks your fast, right? So it's already a little something. So if I have it clear just with oil, then I'm not breaking a fast, but I have it with coconut cream and that helps me continue, not the fast, but I'm still in fat burning because I haven't had carbohydrates. So I will do that early and I'm often up by 4.30, 5 o'clock in the summertime easily because if the sun's up or almost, I want to be. So I'll do that, but I'll work for a few hours and be so distracted that I'm not hungry. And the first time that I eat before I'm going to exercise, it is probably something like sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, uh, raw cashews. So it's something higher in fat especially right now while I'm in COVID-19, I'm not doing a lot of long endurance training. I don't need carbohydrates. I'm doing slow walking. So if you want to burn more fat, you're going to eat fat because that's all it is. And I'm only eating because I'm hungry and I'd be distracted or have a lower energy output if I didn't eat. So that's how I start. When I come back, I'll wait about an hour, somewhere between an hour and an hour and a half, so that I have better muscle protein synthesis, and I'll have a smoothie. Generally, that's a, you know, got some fruit in it, definitely got some kind of greens, kale, spinach, it's a super blend. Um, I'll sometimes put cucumber in it, um, sometimes avocado. I will add um, nuts or seeds to it, uh, turmeric, and ginger right now are super popular. I want to decrease inflammation, boost my immune system. So do you. I'm putting protein and fiber in it. So I'm full for hours after that and uh, feeding my muscles so that I can hold on to that lean muscle mass. And then it's a lot of water in between those meals and while I'm walking, lots of water. And then dinner, I have in the earlier side. So I'm usually trying to eat or prep it if I'm available by about five and um, you know it'll be based around some kind of protein so it might be scallops it might be salmon it might be I love Mexican flavors so I might make some kind of a taco meat with bison sometimes I'll use beef but I really like bison even venison um, is another option so it's um, wild or elk is another option that I'll use. 
I'll make cod um, in several different ways because cod is so mild. It'll take on flavors of other things and tons of vegetables. So depending on what I have it with, it's generally not a salad. You know, I'm not, I rarely eat salads anymore except if I'm out um, and usually for a lunch meal then when I do it. But I'm getting all my greens, leafy greens in that smoothie. And what I get later is usually roasted or it's grilled or maybe steamed or sauteed with a little flavoring like coconut aminos, sesame seeds. Um, so tons of ways that I love and enjoy vegetables and I enjoy them all. And I try to do seasonal. So, you know, during the summer, I'll focus on you know, from spring to summer, asparagus, you know, I can always come back to cauliflower and broccoli and carrots, and those are there year round, but Brussels sprouts, later it'll be zucchini, summer squash, green beans, you know, that are coming fresh out of the garden, tomatoes, cucumbers, those types of things. So tons of variety. And that's kind of a day. I might have some berries and coconut cream on it for dessert and uh, a little bit of, uh, resistant starch carbohydrates. If I'm cycling through carbs, I will do sweet potatoes, uh, butternut squashes, um, sometimes chilled white potatoes. And, um, that's it. It's super easy. Super easy. Number two is how do you exercise differently now than when you were younger? Okay. Well, first, let me explain that I made a lot of mistakes, as all of us did, because we didn't know any better. This was the best science we had then. So to simplify it, I exercised a lot, all the time. And we were all thinking more is better, and the more I exercise, the more I get fit. And I'm fitter than somebody else, or fitter than I was yesterday, and I can do more. So I used to teach when I started uh, teaching, I was probably a sophomore, was probably not a sophomore. It was the soft, between sophomore and junior year of my college that I got certified for the first time by AFA, if you will. And as soon as I started teaching for work, um, whether for the Y on campus, I think was one of my first jobs teaching on stages, really in auditoriums that were used to be classrooms. And teaching in gyms, you know, if I was teaching in a gym, I would stay and exercise more after the class. So I was easily exercising for, you know, a couple hours a day, every day, every single day. So lots and lots of exercise, more cardiovascular exercise than anything else. The strength training exercise I did was probably in those conditioning exercises on the floor, donkey kicks, leg lifts, um, you name it you know, that was what I did. Arm circles with Jane Fonda. That's, you know, what I was doing. So not paying attention really to my muscle, to how I boost my metabolism, keep it high, start building bone density. That's what I would do if I knew now. So, and that's segueing into this third question. So I exercise very differently now in by, I focus on strength training twice a week. I focus on interval training and I don't do a lot of long endurance training. As a rule, I am an endurance lover. I love to do Ironman. I enjoyed training for marathons, although I can't even imagine it now. I don't, number one, have the time to do that. And I know that the moment I'm in in my life, I would probably be drilling myself into the ground with adrenal fatigue trying to do that. So it's not even on my radar. Um, so that third question is, how would you exercise if you were in your 20s now knowing what I do? So I kind of hinted at that. Definitely, I would get into the weight room much more regularly. And I was lifting weights. So I lifted weights regularly in college, you know, both because I had to, it was part of classes in some cases, but, you know, when you're done with the class at the end of the semester, you either continue on your own or you don't. And, you know, weight training and availability to accessibility to those things wasn't as easy. And it wasn't as normal, potentially, for a young female co-ed to walk into those 
gyms alone and, and become a member. It was still kind of new that everybody should be exercising. So um, I would have told my younger self, you need to lift weights. Make sure you're doing that. Focus on the bone density. Focus on being comfortable in the gym. And you're going to be much more likely to do that regularly in your 30s and your 40s and your 50s. Thankfully, I did. Except when I was injured, you know, there were no other times when I wasn't. But um, I would lift a little heavier, not do any of that silly, you know, 20, 25 repetitions, super light weights, all that crazy stuff. <laughs> and stop wasting so much time. I was tired a lot in my 20s even. And, you know, as a grad student and an undergrad, I was tired all the time. And not just because I was teaching at, you know, 6 a.m. and then doing a class sometimes at 5.30, but because if I taught at 6 a.m., then I would exercise more after the class. If I taught at, you know, 5.30 p.m., I would exercise more after the class. And um, it was just so much, and that the thinking was really bad. So do less. Do it more frequently right now, but don't do a ton of anything. Four is how much sleep do you get? Okay, how much sleep do I get is really the same as how much sleep do I need because I draw boundaries around this. It doesn't matter to me if, of course, we're not going to conferences now, which is probably one of the reasons I loved a conference, honestly, that had to be virtual. It was online about a month ago, a little bit more. But I slept in my own bed. I got up, you know, on my own time and we had to shift the time because there were people from... Australia on the call and around the world and so we didn't start until 11 which was awesome so I woke up on my own time exercised on my own time <laughs> and you know then I also didn't necessarily have to feel like I needed to go to the party at night and I'm such an introvert it's not that I don't love the people but um you know I'm such an introvert and I once I spent the day with somebody I kind of need to recharge my batteries and it's good that you know that about yourself as much as I love working with groups of people, being on stage, motivating people, teaching in classrooms, and I always will, the balance for me has to be the opposite. Lots of quiet time. And so I um, can be in bed, you know, between 8 and 9 p.m. Doesn't matter what time of year it is, but if it's winter and it's dark at 5, you know, my light starts going out internally. And, you know, I sleep more in the winter because I'm totally solar powered. So, you know, if we talk and we're talking, you know, I'm in bed by eight, I might wake up by four, four thirty. It's only like eight and a half hours of sleep. So it's not a ton because I go, you know, so early and get up so early, but that's where I do best. Um, my wake up time is typically the same though. I don't sleep in. So if I am up, I'm having to travel and, uh, wasn't put in charge of the schedule, you know, then I, if I'm up until 10, I'm still going to be up at four or four thirty. So that's where I get sleep deprivation. If I do number five is, do I drink alcohol? I can't remember who asked me this question, but you know, it's not that I don't. Um, so I'll have a glass of wine sometimes at a party. I will have a margarita sometimes. Usually that's not because I'm at a Mexican restaurant, by the way, that is because it's been a really hard day. I can think about the last time that I had um, a margarita and that was it. You know, it was challenging times and, uh, and I wasn't driving and I was in a hotel with some friends, actually family, and uh, I just needed one. So that was that. So um, I do. But here's the thing. Even, you know, in high school, I was probably the last, you know, we're not supposed to say that, but... I was the last probably in my class, one of them, to try anything. I didn't really like it. And, um, you know, my parents enjoyed social drinking and, you know, whether they were out to dinner and I was around it or they had friends over. They were older parents and conservative, but they enjoy their alcohol. My mom will still go out and order, <laughs> uh, you know, a glass of wine or something else, a margarita, and uh, she's fine. Um, but it just, you know, I never felt great afterward. So whether I don't metabolize it well or not, and I love, I'm a morning person and I don't want anything to interfere with my mornings. 
I don't know many people who drink who love to get up early in the morning. Uh, maybe they're out there, but it's just for me. The other piece of it is leadership. And, you know, it's not a big deal for me. So if I don't want to have to be affected by peer pressure, like I'm not going to drink to make other people comfortable and I'm not, not drinking to be righteous or religious. So first of all, it just never was really a fit for me. Trust me. I've had moments where I've had a lot of fun and, you know, I like to tell people I either usually don't drink at all or I am standing on the table. Um, having a good time, but you know, it's not worth it to me. It's not about calories, but you know, it should for many of us be about how it's metabolized. It's metabolized as sugar. So, you know, if you know your sugar is causing belly fat, you know, right now in midlife, you know, I'm fortunate that it's not a choice for me and that I didn't get hooked into that. You know, I love good wine thing. Just not my deal. So, um, there is that. Somebody recently asked me a backup to that, which is, do you cook with it? And, and I do. So I make a chili that I love with beer in it, dark beer. Um, I will make some sauces with, you know, no longer with cream, but with cashews, soaked cashews. And there's often wine in that, but it usually kick, um, cooks off, right? So the alcohol isn't actually left. It's not going to be a big deal. Number six is, are, were you always in shape? So I would have to say no. Outwardly, you know, I think there's the danger and I don't know why or how the question was asked. So was I always kind of a, an average weight? You know, was I, if the question is, was I ever really overweight? The answer to that is no. But I will tell you that I think it doesn't matter what your weight and shape. And certainly I wasn't in great shape in high school. I mean, I... Um, was out for sports, but I used to describe this long time ago um, as I went out for golf and softball. And those were two sports where you, you get to stand still a lot of the time. <laughs> Little did I know. So now, of course, you know, you would run a lot more for softball. You would run even for golf to be in shape because we know how much more important that is to the whole idea of the game is being overall in good shape. And um, you know, yet, you know, basketball didn't end up being my thing, but I, you know, I didn't love the running and the conditioning. Had I been in better shape, you know, I may have enjoyed it more. I was, you know, vertically challenged. That wouldn't have changed, but I still may have enjoyed it a little bit more. Track, um, you know, I didn't enjoy that either. I think I would have because obviously I became a runner later and loved it. I might have liked cross country better, but I just you know, never caught that bug and the have to and the, you know, run so hard that you get sick never appealed to me. So was I always in shape? You know, outwardly, I may have looked just fine, average, in good shape, you know, and I did enjoy activity, you know, whenever I tried most activities. I loved golf. Um, I loved softball. I loved playing catch. I mean, since I was a little girl, I loved it. I loved the whole idea about the game and baseball and softball and that culture. And, you know, I loved being athletic and, and it was a value in my family. But I wouldn't say that I was in great shape or that it came easily. And, you know, I went through periods of time where, you know, I struggled with disordered eating and I wouldn't say quote unquote had a disorder. I don't know that I was ever diagnosed or I know I wasn't, but, um, self-diagnosis, I would say, yeah, definitely. I flirted with that. And I think a lot of people did during that era of, you know, early mid eighties. Um, I was kind of near the time of Karen Carpenter's story coming out and, you know, I struggled and there's a line there that you can cross easily. And so my own vision of myself wasn't that I was in good shape or that I was um, in control, you know, was far more out of control. So in that, you know, I still can empathize with a lot of people who may be larger size people because the thought process is the same. And I have the science to help people and have worked with a lot of people who are obese and larger size women and certainly 
you know, the hormone side of things from later. Number seven, you run a business, travel a lot, and make tons of videos. So like us, you've got stress and you're always so positive. Ah, how do you do that? Well, you know, I've thought about that a little bit lately. Um, some, a good friend complimented me on that recently. And of course it was probably three days before my mood tanked because I was feeling like the world is conspiring against me. Technology is not my friend. Um, you know, I just, lots of things, the wheels were coming off the bus and so I wasn't feeling very positive, but for the most part, I am blessed, I guess, with being optimistic. I do, for whatever reasons, you know, even though right now a lot of things are, you know, not the way I'd like them to be, you know, whether, whether you're talking, you know, where you live right now and want it to live, your, your business, your finances, the future and certainty versus uncertainty, relationships, I mean, all of that, I still feel that there's some kind of a master plan and that it will all be all right. Things will work out. And I don't know why I feel that way, but I do. And so I capitalize on that. And I think knowing I, you should know, I majored as a grad student in exercise psychology. And so I've been observing, you know, all those strategies, techniques that we can use to apply to somebody, whether they're in sport or exercise for operating and performing at their best. And one of those is placebo. And in the last five years or so, placebo effect has gotten so much more press. And I truly believe that you have to first believe it and, you know, read a Wayne Dyer book if you need to, but you've got to believe it and then you'll see it you'll be able to create it. But if your cells don't believe it, I mean, you can't tell yourself some affirmation you've written on a mirror, but that's where it comes from. So if you don't have it, go get it. Number eight is what made you create Flipping 50? Um, interestingly enough, I didn't set out to do it. I, when I left my job originally, um, and cut off, you know, no longer I was teaching at the university. So that TIAA crap, the security related to that job, that was probably harder to leave than anything. Um, because then it was a couple of years later that I left the position at a privately owned club as personal training director and leaving that very comfortable, very very flexible job, but, you know, uh, a lot of hours, <laughs> you know, I could do those 80 hours whenever I wanted to, as long as I hit my numbers, but it was just so much and it was stressful and I felt like I needed to leave, but I left because I really wanted to help. The bigger mission of Flipping 50, whether you know this or not, is to up level the quality of trainers in the fitness industry. And to make sure we keep the good ones because the good ones love the science about how to exercise, but they're terrible at marketing themselves and, and selling. And while I'm, I'm talking right now to, to you who are the consumer, you know, I think this is um, a conversation that's worth having, but we have to sell in order for you to get fit. You have to buy what we offer free programs really don't work. You've got to get some skin in the game, quote unquote, in order to invest in yourself time and energy. And so I believe that we need to give good, high quality trainers the skills to market themselves and to sell, to sell something to someone who they know they can help something of quality because there are a lot of people out there selling things that are not for you and not of quality. They just want to make the sale. And so that's what I started and set out to do. 
and realized that if I want to have that conversation with trainers and health coaches and help them really get started and stay with it, that I needed to be still training in some way. I needed to still be doing it. So I narrowed my focus on the market that I had been most working with or working with the most since I was 22. I was always given older clients and case studies because I was comfortable with them. And it was a little bit accidental, but I was raised by, um, I was the fourth child of my mom's. She was almost 40 when she had me, when before that was sexy, and she remarried a man 10 years older than she was. So he literally was 50 when they got married. He'd been a bachelor, lived with his mother. I cannot make this stuff up. And uh, talk about reinvention, right? So I think about myself right now, you know, being um, just six years married and having, well, a 10-year-old, because that would have been me. And thought, wow, I'd be different. <laughs> and, and if I were doing that, but that's the reason Flipping 50 started is I knew I had to be talking to you and still be in it selling and marketing and growing a business. But what happened is I now have two hands out. I have these two businesses and Flipping 50 took off because women do ask for help. We ask for directions. We go finding it. And trainers and health coaches sometimes find it really hard. Entrepreneurs find it really hard to ask for help. We're afraid to admit that we need it. And I can talk to that in just a little bit, I will. But that's what made me create Flipping 50 originally. And then I really dug into it because that first year I, I experienced what was and is now the Flipping 50 fitness formula for women. Exercise less and eat more. Just do both with purpose. Number nine is what do you do in your spare time? <laughs> okay, or wish that you had more time for. Better question. I added that second part because honestly, I don't have a lot of spare time. I work a lot. I'm working on that, on trying not to work a lot, on being able to set boundaries around I have to make time for myself. So I live alone right now outside of Truman, many of you know. Um, you know, and when you when you live with somebody else, there are you know, unspoken expectations that you do things together and you're going to eat meals together or enjoy relaxation in the evening together. Well, you know, I don't have that. And, um, so I've gotten into some really bad habits and, um, especially now during COVID it's, I've, you know, increased the obligations on myself to serve our audience with more and more, but because, you know, I might've taken, two hours out of my day or two chunks early and late, that time still has to be paid back to where I was spending it before. So adding more doesn't mean I booted something else out because I can't. I'm running a business and I have to make sure it's running up, not down. So there's that. But what are those things? So number one is I put reading. That's the first thing that came to my mind. I have so many great books by friends and colleagues that are both inside my, you know, learning realm. So I'm a student for a lifetime. I love to continue learning and the science is booming so that you really need to. So I love learning about food and nutrition and exercise and in the endocrinology and hormones and psychology. And, and I've got stacks and stacks of books to do that, but I can't make them through. So my reading in the evening before bed, since COVID especially, is not that. I've picked up frivolous fiction and that's all I will allow myself to read at night. The other thing is um, golf. Golf is such a time consumer and although I think about golf and I've thought about golf for a long time, I haven't played. You know, and I barely played while I was watching my son in high school because while he was doing that a couple of times I was training for Ironman and those are both huge time spends so I had no extra time you know unless it was Mother's Day and you know Easter and a rare occasional weekend you know I could play golf so I need to get back to it you know and um, 
again, though, it's, you know, that's a three or four hour investment. Um, spending more time with friends and family, literally. And I know right now it's harder for me because, um, because we're social distancing, number one, but number two, we're just not traveling. And so I need to travel back to Boulder. Um, I need to travel back to Iowa, you know, and, um, so that's probably number one, um, as far as something outside of, you know, just like if I were going to drop something and go do it in five minutes, I could read or golf, but you know, that would be a longer, bigger thing. And the other thing is art. So I began as a graphic designer a million years ago, thought I was going to, you know, I grew up drawing, painting, four years of art in high school, thinking I'm going to be a graphic designer. And I was a major for two years in college before I changed. And um, yet, you know, I still enjoy it, but I don't do it anymore. I, I live vicariously through my nephew, Eric, who um, also passed that down to his son, Sam. And I love, you know, looking and watching and um, I, I need to pick that up. So that would be it. 10. What questions do you wish people asked about exercise? Great question. Oh, you know, the question I think is, what should I do? And this is like, instead of going looking for something that you think that you need or you want, you know, like, what exercises can I do for my belly? Because the assumption in that question when somebody asks that, that's a big one, um, is that exercises for your belly are going to get rid of belly fat and they will not. So, so it's, you know, what should I do so that I can ask the question is what do you want? What transformation do you want? Or what are you not, you know, what are you not a hundred percent satisfied with right now? What do you wish would change? So then I can ask that and we can together find the best answer based on what they're doing now. That's not working or what they've tried. 11 is why does psychology play a big part in your coaching programs for both fitness professionals and for women who are flipping 50? Yes. And I might have alluded to that already, so I'll keep this one short. So I know already, you guys, this is going to be a longer podcast than most, but hopefully you're staying with me or you'll, you'll go on a longer walk or two walks and you'll get it. Psychology is like if you don't get between the ears we're not going to get below the shoulders and you've got to stick with it long enough to start seeing some results to stick with it physically. So it's mentally knowing that we're going to be probably countering. You have to do some unlearning of the things you learned when you were 18 and 20 and 25 and 30. Those things aren't going to work anymore, but you're still going to tend to believe them. And I know that's where you are. I know it because we were, those were formidable years, you know, I, three years old, I know is supposed to be that, but you know, when you were learning and really absorbing content about yourself and about health and fitness, the things you learned way back then, you know, and now you're looking up and thinking, I got to get back to that. I got to pick my fitness back up. It's the most recent content you've got that you trust because there's so much online. I think we all stop and say, okay, I don't know if I can believe that or not, right? When we read something online, because there's enough things next to it that you know you can't trust. So it's going to make you doubt, you know, everything right and or wrong online. And so that's why the psychology has got to be a big part of it. Because I know change is hard. It's one of the hardest things we'll do. So to change your thoughts, you'll be able to better change your behavior. And then you'll start feeling better then we lose the need for motivation because you'll be committed. Feeling good feels good. 12 is what words describe your most important values that you have, aside from fitness and health, of course, which is of course, right? So you'll see fitness and health everywhere in my life all day, every day. But I think these words are the most important to me. And I can almost say this um, like immediately because I've just finished a couple posts for fitness pros, you know, and recent graduates in kinesiology who are, you know, I feel so badly for them, but I want to give them hope and I want to give them a kick in the pants that they cannot sit around. So it's number one, authenticity, 
I mean, being real and she's, please, you see me. I'm showing my roots. I mean, literally the roots of my hair. I'm showing my roots online some days. I'm showing myself in the morning, no makeup, drinking coffee or tea. So I'm literally showing you what my life is like. And, you know, probably 20% of the time I have makeup on and I actually look like I fixed myself up, you know, and I believe that that's got to be a part of it. At first I just felt like I was being lazy and I was beating myself up for it. But then I was like, why would I why would I do this? I mean, if I'm at home doing a workout, I'm not going to put on makeup. And, you know, when I go into the kitchen and drink coffee, I don't have showered and put on makeup before I do that. So I feel like it's got to be real and authentic. And I wouldn't want to attract somebody who didn't want that. So that's important. Seeing the real thing, and it's not always pretty. And integrity is also important. And you know, a way that that shows up for me is, you know, if we say something at Flipping 50 as a policy, or we say there's a sale and the sale rate ends Sunday night, you know, then when somebody asks me about it on Monday, I have to, as much as I would love to let them in, I have to say, no, I'm so sorry, you missed it. I have to, because, you know, whether anybody else knows it or not, I know it that I'm good for my word and that's important and that's the the people I was raised by (laughs) and sometimes it's hard to live up to their standards but I'm so very glad I had them. Creativity is the third thing and you know that I feel I can still tap into that artist and that that creative way to solve problems and right now there's never been a bigger, better time to need creativity because all industries, the way we do business has changed, but in fitness for sure, right? People don't want to go to gyms, even though they are back open. The way we've done personal training before has changed forever. The way um, fitness will be conducted in the future has changed. And so I've got to be creative, not just about mine, but if I'm going to help other fitness professionals, It's a big part of what we've got to be willing to do. And then the last one is abandon. And I don't know if that's the right word, but it's like losing the what will people think voice inside my small town girl head. Because, you know, that's, we operated a lot like that in my family, (laughs) you know, and we had to stay within the lines because I'm talking we 1800 in my little town. So other people were going to know about anything you did and good, bad, or, or ugly. And uh, so it's losing that concept of what's anybody else going to think. Because really, you know, if I'm developing a business or a thought or I'm doing something, I have to trust my own gut. Thirteen is how you doing out there. <laughs> what's been the hardest thing about building a business? And this was asked by someone, I think, who heard my story and knew that I was 49 when I stepped away from, I was working for somebody else. I was doing some things on the side. I was speaking, presenting, doing some workshops, earning money on my own and personal training on my own. But, you know, that was maybe 10, 20% at most of my total income revenue. I worked for other people. They paid me, you know, the check. Um, a little bit more independence in that I was commission based and I loved that because I, I had ownership in my position when I was doing that. But the hardest thing, I, I immediately put two things here on kind of looking at my notes, preparing for this, but by far the hardest personal and professionally, gosh, I can, my voice will break up if I'm not careful is asking for help. And why that is so hard, I still do not know. You know, I don't know if it's imposter syndrome, you know, letting people think that, you know, I know it all is what I need to do. And I don't think, I I don't believe that at my core anymore. I know that none of us knows right now in this moment we're in, but asking for help. I never saw my, my stepfather do that. Not, you know, he may have done it had good friends he must have done it but he was the kind of guy who 
would give anybody else the shirt off his back, but, um, you know, not ask for help himself. So I don't know if that's where it came from, but there it is. And the second thing is, um, that has been so hard is getting used to strategically using debt, know what a good risk is and what it's not. Um, that's been really hard. So again, same guy established my rules. So, you know, looking back at parents who had a safe, conservative job for their entire career, got a pen and a clock, you know, and certain um, benchmarks along the way, and, you know, had the pension and the retirement, and, and that's what they did. And going from having zero debt, you know, owning my house, owning my car, you know, paying all the bills, putting things in the bank, um, to then starting to experience what debt is like and that, you know, can you handle this? Like, can you sleep at night? That, that's been probably the hardest. 14 is what's an ideal day look like for you? All right. So I'm going to paint this picture here of, you know, and I, I kind of just described it and I would, this would be if I did a staycation right here at my house, or it would be a vacation. And I highly encourage you, if you're listening to do this, what's your ideal day like? I mean, literally, and then turn the page and say, how much is your daily life like that? Okay. Cause there you go. Now you got something to write home about. So my ideal day like is, um, I, I'm awake early. I'm doing some creative work, you know, alone time. You know, I get in a workout fairly early, um, cardio and strength. And here's the other thing is I have no appointments. So I don't know about all of you, but I really despise appointments right now. So being the owner, you never get to walk away from it. And there's always something on. It's like you have to respond. And I think that's my responsibility right now until I have another COO, somebody else in charge or project managers that can report to me. I have to, you know, be the stop. So, um, there is that no appointment. So I'm doing these things on my own time. I'm going to get some kind of a workout, whether I'm due for cardio or I'm due for strength. And then, you know, golfing or hiking, something outdoors and active and maybe poolside reading after that or a walk on the beach or yoga in the late afternoon. So a little bit more movement late. Um, and early evening, kind of good, tired feeling, you know, and grilled food outdoors. I, I think number one, grilled food always tastes better. Food cooked outdoors always tastes better. It doesn't matter if I'm doing it here at home. And actually, I really enjoy, you know, the maybe it's the control, but eating healthier is easier at home. That's my opinion. You know, and it's not that I don't love to go out, but I am very particular about where I want to go out and, you know, farm to table kind of places or places like True Food Kitchens. Those are some of my faves. Um, I like to be, the last detail here, it's a place that taking a deep breath feels so cleansing. So that probably for me is the mountains or the beach and um, either one of those. So I haven't yet been to Sedona. Notice I didn't say the desert and I live in Scottsdale. So um, I didn't anticipate being here forever. <laughs> so we'll see what happens after this. Um, but I definitely like to explore Southern Utah more. Um, it was a beautiful drive from Boulder, Colorado to Scottsdale. And uh, I, my mouth was open the whole way. It was awe and beauty. So I'd like to go look at that and then who knows. Number 15 is you're ordering off a menu when you're out. What do you order? <laughs> and, aha, uh -huh, interesting. And if I splurge, what do I do? That's the next question, 15 and 16. Okay, so definitely something seafood or fish usually is what I'll order. Um, and then I often will double the vegetables or if I'm ordering like a a main entree that comes with vegetables, I'll say, can you double that, but don't give me the bread or don't bring the white potatoes. Can you skip that? Give me twice as much um, sauteed vegetables or whatever. 
or I'll order another side of vegetables. So tons and tons of vegetables and some kind of fish or seafood usually. Salmon, scallops, shrimp, those are my faves. Um, although crab, uh, lobster, I would eat. Okay, my splurge, if I'm going to do it, would be sushi. And, you know, white rice, really not on my list anymore. Um, and some of the sauces, you know, are probably going to have gluten and soy in them. I don't really do that either. But it's definitely worth it occasionally. It's most fun with my son or, you know, friends and family when you have a big table. So no, do I at the grocery store buy sushi in a box? No. Um, you know, I do like sashimi, which is just the raw fish. So I can, you know, leave the sauce and the white rice. But again, I'm not going to do that myself. And I just, I enjoy the few, there's a few rolls I really love. Green River is a favorite. Sometimes it's not on the menu, but you can usually ask for it. And then real splurge, maybe a few bites of the Great Wall of China cake at P.F. Chang's. And that's so much more about um, memory or memories with either friends or with my son. But seriously, it's addicting. And a few bites of that will put you, put me in a coma. <laughs> 17 is what I won't, what I don't do anymore that I used to. This in regard again to it's eating out. Um, there's almost nothing at a Mexican restaurant that I want to order um, so between the marinades, you know, like marinating chicken that might be in a taco salad, for instance, or, um, the flour tortillas, the, the corn tortillas, the cheese, the corn chips, I, I don't feel very good after any of that. So honestly, the last time I did it was about a year ago, almost exactly. In fact, the day after I'd moved here. So I drove here on a Monday, Tuesday, my brother-in-law showed up early enough, too early, so early, that with the, the moving van, we had all kinds of time and the guys to move it in weren't coming till Wednesday and just to be safe with, and he's like, you know, well, we could sit out at the pool and drink beer or do you want to unload? And so I was like, okay, let's unload. So we did it in hundred degrees. We unloaded that whole thing and we barely stopped to eat. So by four o'clock, I mean, we were both sweaty and hungry, and so we went out for, I don't know, late lunch, early dinner, whatever that was, and um, he said, where do you want to go? And I, I don't know, somewhere close, because I don't have a lot of time. I had to do a class, actually, that night, and so we stopped at a Mexican restaurant, and the next morning, I my gut told me, don't do that again, ever, ever again, <laughs> so, and I'd had a taco salad in one of those flour tortillas. I enjoyed it at the moment, but, and, and honestly, I didn't love it. It wasn't as good as I anticipated, you know, having not had it for quite a while. So there you go. And the other thing, I don't do Chinese food anymore either. The sauces don't appeal to me and, uh, just gluten, white rice kind of thing. Not a, not a great fit. 18 is what's your go-to exercise. And I alluded to that a little bit earlier. I snuck it in, but it's 20 minutes, say, of interval training a couple times a week, whether I'm on a bike doing it or it's uh, just sprints, intervals, or I'm doing it with our Flipping 50 virtual membership, um, just live on Friday and Monday mornings right now. That's a go-to. So that's a real boost in fat burning and visceral fat. That's the belly fat. And lately during COVID, oh, oh, sorry, and two times a week strength training. I mean, that's just not compromisable. That's not going anywhere. So I absolutely will do that. We're not going to retain our lean muscle mass and keep a metabolism without it. So if something had to go, it would probably be the interval training, but the strength training would stay. And lately during COVID, this me, an eight-time Ironman, and more marathons before that, I've been walking, just walking. It's been, for me, a break from the news, the stress, uh, social media, additional service that I've added to support community members. It's just my time, you know, and I've, it's been a lot to juggle. 
People talk about extra time in watching Netflix, you know, during this time. I don't know if anybody really has experienced that, but I know my life has certainly not become slower, not at all. If anything, I'm busier. So um, time-efficient exercise and keeping it simple exercise is key. 19 is what I've done during COVID that I wasn't doing before. I've definitely done more immune-boosting supplements. So I've dialed up my vitamin C tremendously. I was already taking a significant amount of vitamin D. You know, and um, it's easy to slack off on certain micronutrients. So I don't know if I um, have been as diligent about that, but I've been just religious about it. I have also um, magnesium and melatonin like a boss. Um, I've not, I don't think I've missed any any nights since it started. Just for the help and the support, getting to sleep and staying to sleep. So, um I've never colored my own hair before COVID. I did that. Uh, (laughs) I organized my closet by type of clothing. Like here's the shirts, the pants, the jackets, and then by color. And I did that because some of you may remember if you follow on Facebook, a friend of mine who owns a clothing store that's doing a really creative way of a business. She does auctions online. So I mean, literally, if you're missing shopping and don't feel like you want to go into stores, you can shop in line. If you love Southwest clothing, oh my gosh, you got to go. It's Stone Feather Road. And I'll put that in the show notes. Um, but it was her who, she came on a Facebook Live with me and talked about how to style for yourself and how to get organized and see what you really have. And um, it's just helped. It's helped my sense of organization kind of get cobwebs out of your head when you do that. And I've also been collaborating more, just reaching out more to experts um, in my network and others and doing more with them, more Facebook Lives, more podcasts, more just sharing content and talking about how is it going. Okay, and last but not least, here's the big one. What's the one question we should have asked you? That's the question that I ask every guest on the end of a podcast. So it's only fair that I would have to answer this. And um, I had a client, um, gosh, it may have been a year ago, maybe, or more. If she happens to be listening, I know you're out there. This is for you (laughs) because I think you asked me that when I had you on a guest, as a guest. So the question is, What's been the most important message of 2019 and 2020 for you? And I say 2019 for me because all of us are experiencing a unique world, shall we say, in 2020. But my 2019 was really not a good year. (laughs) Started with mold exposure, a move I didn't want to make. I loved where I lived, um, both in Boulder and in the mountains, and uh, didn't want to go. But I did, and uh, it was kind of a quick change, and it needed to be because I needed to get out of my lease while it was up, and it wasn't necessarily the best of circumstances, shall we say that. So that was very stressful. I was training for an Ironman at that time, and it certainly wasn't the year that I had imagined it to be. Um, I had several issues come up with business and kind of that getting comfortable, comfortable with debt and how that works. And relationship, um, you know, things that, you know, are always going to be there um, and disappointments and, and all of it was just an overload for me. So that's the backstory to why the question. But the most important message I think has been forgiveness. It's been a message that I've got to observe forgiveness. So that that is about me and not anybody else. So forgiving somebody else or, or forgiving myself for the past and the present and the future. Just why not? <laughs> so it doesn't make somebody right if you forgive them and it frees you. That's what it's done for me. So forgiving the fact that maybe you've gained weight, you got a divorce, you have a relationship that didn't pan out, that others right now, in this moment, don't have the same beliefs you do, or holding on to negative energy right now, allowing it around you, 
you know, none of us have the bandwidth for that right now. So if somebody wants to be in your life, they will. If they aren't, there's a reason. And if you allow, you know, a post or the news to upset you, you're choosing to feel that way. You're exposing yourself to it. So you either stop watching and engaging or you understand that you want to feel bad. You're comfortable with it and then you've got to get that shit figured out. So those emotional feelings affect your physical energy. We can't be in good shape. We can't be in good health if we carry them around. So forgive somebody else or forgive yourself for not being where you wanted to be and decide to get there. So whether it's fitness or your business, not forgiving will weigh you down. And there you have it. 20 questions, one hour. Okay. Longest show ever, potentially. I'm going to leave a few things in the show notes. So I'll leave the resources we talked about, um, the Flipping 50 virtual membership, the cafe. Doors will be open if they're not at this very moment. So get on the notifications list if you want to learn more. And that's all you're doing. We're not, not going to charge anything we don't have. But now's the time, right? Get started. Six months and you could have reversed the effects of aging of 179 genes. That's pretty good news. And I'll also provide the resource to the Flipping 50 Fitness Specialist if you're a personal trainer or health coach or you'd like to be. And I believe I mentioned one other resource, and I will scroll back up and think about the questions and post that there as well. There you have it. That's my 20 questions. You now know me a little bit better. So leave a comment below the show notes. I would love to know if you have a question that I left off. Promise not ever, ever to do another hour-long podcast. But if you got a long walk out of this one, then it was all worth it. All right, what are you waiting for? Let's start flipping 50 today.